Amazing. I think we are officially live. I'm gonna hang tight for a few minutes while folks start to trickle in. I don't know about y'all, but I, I seriously considered whether or not I was gonna put like person pants on today, you know, the kind of like business and then pajamas on the bottom has been clutch for 2020. I'm definitely wearing sweatpants. Yeah. Here, so. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta stay comfy. Exactly. And this the year of 2020. Especially with uh, our first snowfall right on cue. <laughs> I know. I know. Feels like feels like winter. Although I I've been away, um, so technically I'm still in quarantine, which makes it all a little bit harder. I've been away for work, so I feel like I missed fall entirely. Like it's the season just skipped for me, and now we're going into a full winter. Where were you? Um, you don't mind in, my asking. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I was in Greece actually. Um, so I've been Ooh. I've been thinking a lot about hypervisibility, uh, like not to jump into it. Because mm -hmm. um, I've been working on a long-term project looking at how AI is impacting refugees in migratory spaces, people on the move. Yeah. Um, and as we can all imagine, COVID is but an afterthought uh, in a lot of these spaces. So Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but I I just got back so I'm I am in quarantine until Friday. Um and then hopefully, well, my first order of business is actually to go check out all the work at the Bentway. <laughs> I was super bummed I couldn't go do that. <laughs> um so I had to make do a with bit a, of time. Yeah. Yeah, I had to make do with with checking it all out virtually. All right, great. So uh, it seems as though people are trickling in and I think we can just get started. I'm sure folks will, will continue to join us. I'm super excited to be here. Um, so I just wanna thank the Bentway for inviting me and super privileged to be amongst these esteemed artists and panelists. Um, to give everyone a bit of context, my name is Kenya Jade Pinto. I'm gonna be your host for the next hour or so. Though I suspect if I do, do my job right, I won't be doing much of the talking at all. At least that's my goal. Um, and you'll be hearing from these incredibly talented artists instead. Now, before uh, we get started, I wanna start with one thing. Years ago, when I was still coming of age, um, my family left Kenya. My home, my beautiful, complicated, multifaceted country and immigrated to Canada in search of a safer, stabler place to live. I've since lived across Turtle Island, first in Calgary, then in Canmore, then back to Calgary and Ottawa through my teens and into my adulthood. And for the last three years or so, I've been privileged to call Toronto home. And, and to be frank, Toronto is the first place that I've lived since leaving Mombasa where I have felt seen in all of my intersectionalities. But I also acknowledge that as a settler here, my visibility, my feeling seen in my communities and my safety comes at the cost of colonization, which has subjected and continues to subject indigenous communities to unimaginable horrors. So wherever you are today, I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on the space you call home, as well as the original peoples of this land and acknowledge and thank them for stewarding this place before you or I ever got here. The Bentway's work takes place on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, and many other Indigenous nations. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Toronto, the place in the water where the trees are standing, is now home to many diverse Indigenous people, and we recognize them as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. And speaking of the Bentway, let me give you a little context. So the Bentway reimagines how we build, experience, activate, and value public space together. Its work is anchored by a new and growing site located under, under Toronto's Gardner Expressway, which is operated, maintained, and programmed by the Bentway Conservancy as a platform for creative practice, public art, and connected urban life. As a new model for public space in Toronto and a forum for social engagement, 
the Bentway continues to evolve amidst the changing landscape of the city, developing opportunities and partnerships that address key issues of our time. Okay, so a couple housekeeping items. This talk includes captions for accessibility. A recording of the transcript of the talk will be made available in the days to come at www.safeinpublicspace.com. And if you have any questions for the panelists, you can submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So we encourage you to use this function, but please make sure that your questions are respectful, honor the work of our panelists, their lived experiences, and the ideas shared today. Are you guys getting, is everyone getting tired of hearing my voice? Um, not too much longer, uh, but I do wanna introduce you to these incredible human beings that are joining me today. Let's start with Raven. Raven is an African Bermudian Mohawk two-spirit queer and transcendent individual. Raven works to change all hierarchical mainstream arts and dance spaces by centering disability justice and advocating for representations of marginalized LGBTQ2S communities. Raven is a co-founder of El Nana Diverse City Dance Company, a queer multiracial dance company that provides affirming accessible dance education to all LGBTQ2S communities. Raven is the artistic director of OVA, Outrageous Victorious Africans Collective, a dance theater collective that shares the contemporary voices of African Black and queer self-identified storytellers. Raven is committed to eradicating all forms of anti-Black racism, supporting Black healing, and liberating Black communities through their work. Cyrus, Cyrus Marcus Ware is an assistant professor at the School of the Arts at McMaster University. He's a Vanier scholar a visual act artist, activist, curator, and educator. Cyrus uses painting, installation, and performance to explore social justice frameworks in Black activist culture. And he's shown widely in galleries and festivals across Canada. He's a core team member of Black Lives Matter Toronto, co-founder of Black Lives Matter Canada, a part of the Performance Disability Art Collective, and an ABD PhD candidate at York University in the Faculty of Environmental Studies. His ongoing curatorial work includes That's So Gay at the Gladstone Hotel and Blackness, Yes, Blockorama. He is the co-editor of the best-selling Until We Are Free, Reflections on Black Lives Matter in Canada. Cyrus's work, Radical Love, is a multimedia installation that centers Black and Afro-Indigenous trans women and non-binary people, creating monuments to trans lives and their survival. Thank you for joining us, you too. Justine, Justine Abigail Yu. Um, she's the co or she's the founder and editor in chief of Living Hyphen, an emerging magazine that explores the experiences of hyphenated Canadians, that is, individuals who call Canada home, but who have roots in often faraway places. She's an award-winning writing workshop facilitator whose work with Living Hyphen has been featured on national and local media outlets, including CTV National News, CBC Metro Morning. Radio Canada International, CBC Ontario Morning, City TV's Breakfast Television, and City News. She's a fierce advocate for, advocate for equity and anti-oppression, whose mission is to stir the conscience and spur social change. Emini. Emini Men is an artist, direct educator, and community-based researcher. He is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Design at OCAD University and co-director of the Public Visualization Lab, OCAD U, York University, and Ryerson. As an artist, Imini has ex exhibited nationally and internationally and has been awarded municipal, provincial, and federal arts council grants to support his work. Imini's practice takes the form of interact interactive installations, interdisciplinary performances, social artworks, and community-based research projects. Public visualization, public visualization Studios work, Receipts, is a multimodal interface that receives, anonymizes, archives, and performs testimonies to anti-Asian aggression in the public space. And both of these installations, Receipts and Radical Love, are currently part of the Bentway's growing Safe in Public Space initiative, which aims to broaden the definition of public safety, addressing new public health challenges presented by COVID, as well as systemic inequities to build a new shared social contract for public space. And you, dear watchers, can view both installations on site 
at the Bentway from now until November 11th and follow the growing online platform of talks, tours, essays, images, and so much more at www.safeinpublicspace.com. That's it for me, pretty much. <laughs> um, so thank, thank you all for, for joining us today. And thank you to, to the artists and to the contributors for being part of this discussion today. This is gonna be a little bit of a unconventional talk in that I'm not necessarily going to moderate. Um, I mean, I will a little bit, but what we're really gonna do is just have a bit of a fluid conversation. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll start it off. Um, I'll ask a question and then we'll let our speakers sort of talk a little bit about their work organically and ask questions of one another. Um, so I'll get started. And my first question is, is for Cyrus, because when I, when I saw your work, I was so moved by the fact that you felt it necessary to have it live in the dark, after dark, at night, glowed up um, and take up space in that way. And it made me think about what our cities are like after dark and how it, how people are impacted by the dark. I was thinking in the context of me as a woman, how the cityscape changes, how my positionality in a cityscape changes. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about why you chose to have that work be so big and bold at night and how you see it sort of interplaying um, in the cityscape that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I did a lot of research to prepare for this project. Um, I knew I wanted <clears throat> to do a project that explored the experiences of Black and Afro-Indigenous trans and non-binary people in public space, because I knew that, you know, for so many uh, of us, it is just such a contested thing, even just to get to exist in public space. So I knew I wanted that as a focus, but I didn't want to assume that I knew what the experience was like, just because I'm a Black trans person. So I interviewed a lot of people. And one of the things that came from that conversation was about how temporality affected affected safety. So, you know, the the in some cases being out in the day, uh, you know, afforded a certain kind of safety. But for many of the people I spoke to, including you, Raven, you know, that this experience of being out at 2 p.m. was much more dangerous than the experience of being out at 2 a.m. because of the presence of people, which shows where the problem is, right? You know, that we have such deep-rooted, embedded transphobia in our society that is so pervasive in how people flex in public space that the sort of general transphobic attacks that are just uh, built into, you know, the shove or the look or the threat of danger that trans people experience when they're walking through the city is so prevalent at 2 p.m. with the proximity of so many people. So I was very interested in what it would mean for a trans person to be out at 2 a.m., perhaps because that's when they felt safest. And what would they encounter in public space? And what would be safer for them when they are out at that time of night? So something that would sort of light up, um, I thought was really interesting and something that would uh, be this beacon of celebration of their existence. You know, oh, by the way, we've expected you. And here we are celebrating you. Um, you were anticipated in our landscape uh, and we want you here, you know? So it was, this uh, attempt at uh, at offering something for the many folks who who perhaps leave a lot of their public time to the wee hours because of safety. That's a really great point, and and I think something that not a lot of folks will maybe have like reflected on in their you know personal experiences if you're not you know, a, a trans person, or if you have a different type of experience during the day versus at night. Um, Justine, I wonder if, if you can sort of share a little bit about your experience kind of within this project and how you were able to contribute. Um, I think that there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of learning that can come from, from your experience as well. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, Cyrus, that you mentioned that. Um, I think as a woman 
I think this might have been what you were alluding to, Kenya Jade, is I always have been more prepared or thinking about my safety or conscious of my state uh, of my safety at night. Um, but actually this summer, um, I experienced um, racial harassment in broad daylight. And this is how I connected uh, with receipts with Imani on this project, um, sharing my experience of actually being in broad daylight in a park in Toronto. Um, and I was just reading my book and a woman came up to me and threatened to call the police on me telling me that I was trespassing and continued to basically um, shout racial slurs and telling me that, you know, all Chinese people should go to jail. We've, you know, I've experienced that anti-Asian racism or hatred that I've heard so much about on the news. And it was at a time that I really didn't expect it um, being in daylight because I, yeah, th that's giving me a lot of pause to think about because always my expectation has been danger at night, you know, as a woman, but actually, I guess, you know, the hyper visibility of my skin in broad daylight actually really pushed that to the forefront, especially during this time, during this climate um, of such tensions. Um, yeah, so now I'm, <laughs> that's given me a lot of pause to think about, actually. So that's how I came to be involved in, in receipts and in this project as a whole. Thank you. And, and Imani, I wonder if you can give a little bit of context about receipts generally and, and what you were able to kind of um, learn from the project. Yeah, so re receipts came together because we, we um, like, the, uh, in addition to some of uh, to the direct health and impacts of COVID-19, we were also uh, we're also experiencing parallel shadow pandemics of racial discrimination and violence and um, uh, housing precarities and uh, homelessness and negative effects of isolation. And uh, these occurrences affected uh, different communities um, or diverse communities in different ways. And the focus the, that comes close to home is uh, the is that of Asian identity. <laughs> and uh, because I'm a Cambodian refugee and um, I'm also, I work at OCAD University where I'm always thinking about the, the, the wellness and the safety and the health of students and faculty and administration. And um, so I, I was in a bunch of these meetings where we we're talking about reentry <laughs> and we we're talking about, uh, about what what are we going to do <laughs> and um, with teaching and teaching online and this urgency to get back into a classroom. And every meeting I would bring up this, this issue that, uh, that was so clear for me in terms of the safety of bodies moving between spaces and the spaces that we can't design or can't control and what will happen, like, are we going to be accountable for our community if we are pushing for, uh, for a quicker reentry? Can we allow agency or provide an option for students to choose when, the students, the faculty and administration to choose when they would go back? And uh, yeah, so I repeated this several times in different meetings, uh, faculty-wide, program-wide, and I made sure that um, so while I was doing this, I was also working with my collaborators and also repeating these, these sentiments and going to workshops about the anti-Asian uh, sentiments that's emerging because of the shadow pandemic. And also talking to folks within my community, the, the artist community, and uh, to skaters too, because I'm also, I've been doing that for like 20 years. And, and so talking, talking a lot. And uh, through that, we, I spoke to my collective and we talked about um, perhaps starting this platform that uses computer vision and text to speech. So computer vision and AI that protects identity, that offers a different type of recording after events have occurred, one that protects uh, immigration status, one that protects relationships with family members and with 
uh, professional networks and uh, one that anonymizes oral testimonies while aestheticizing to, uh, to address notions of, uh, to address that sentiment that you get from being dehumanized through, uh, through the sharing of your experience and also to respond to, uh, to disbelief and doubt that those occurrences do happen in public space and to reinscribe the, the language and the weight of the words within that type of setting. So, so yeah, <laughs> so, so that that's how it, it kind of came together. And uh, the folks at Public Visualization Lab were very generous in supporting and uh, listening. And, uh, and then we started to, I was also on a lot of boards, <laughs> like the F Facebook message boards uh, that uh, were connected to mutual aid in terms of uh, uh, responding to anti-Asian uh, sentiments and occurrences within Quebec, because I'm from Montreal and, and the support network there really fed into, uh, into this project. And that's how I found Justine's story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Any questions from any of you before I, I continue? All right. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah, of course. I don't, know, I don't know if it's so much a question as a response to what you were saying in the end, like the, these two installations that are up right now, what really struck me, um, was one with receipts, the anonymity of it, um, how powerful that was because I guess in that experience, so, you know, at the aftermath of being harassed, uh, racially harassed this summer, I, you know, I took it upon myself to share my video. I, I documented it. I, I, you know, videotaped the whole encounter and I shared it on my social media. I shared it with media outlets and things like that. And it became viral and it just brought up so many questions for me about the fact that I am in a position of privilege where I feel comfortable enough to share an experience that was so, um, for me personally, maybe not physically violent, but emotionally violent. Um, and thinking about how many people may not be in that level of comfort to share this, you know? And I, you know, I have Living Hyphen, which is this community that I feel accountable to or responsible for. And I felt a responsibility really to speak up because of this, but there are so many other people who, who don't, who aren't in that position. And also looking at Radical Love where, you know, you talk about Cyrus, the, I guess the questioning of the safety in public spaces of, of these marginalized groups, but also in a way that is framed according to their terms, where the, the images that you use are really beautiful and joyful and not perpetuating this idea of, or this stereotype that we have of the victim, you know, I, I don't know what that conception is supposed to look like, but I think it really turns it on its head. And that's what I love about that. And Again, this is not a question, more of a response, but I guess something that I have been thinking about is like, how do we get beyond this rush to document? You know, I know I recognize how important it is for us to document this and to show proof of our experiences, but at the same time, like I've had to rewatch it. You know, I've had to rewatch my personal experience plus so many other black indigenous people of colors experiences of racism and it's like, at what point do we stop and just believe these stories? When will testimony, you know, vocal or verbal testimony be enough? I don't know if anyone has an answer to that, but that's yeah, something I've that I've just been, of, yeah. I've been thinking a lot about audience, right? And who we're making our work for. And in a call like this an open, you know, where we were asked to think about public space and, and public safety more broadly, you know, I, I made a decision that my audience was going to be us. It was going to be racialized tra trans people, you know? And so these, we, we know the stories. We know the horror. We, we know it. We, I mean, I, I interviewed people and I included it in my, in my 
in my proposal for people who didn't know it, but we know it. We already know it. It's so we we know it. So I wanted instead what I was going to offer us was something that was about celebration, that was about love, that was about um, honoring. I mean, think about these what's happened this summer with those you know these monuments to slavery and colonialism that are getting celebrated everywhere that are dreadful that should be taken down. And I was like, no, no, no. What if we actually created monuments for people who are actually deserving of our respect and admiration you know these folks who are often unsung heroes you know these folks who are leading the way um so all of you like raven i would love to hear from you but i mean you all are just doing such incredible work to make the city better for all of us you know when you make the world safer for black trans women you're making the world safer for everyone and you're doing so much work to try to make the world safer for all of us and why not celebrate you 10 or 12 feet tall you know lit up you know uh as beacons of hope in the middle of the night yeah i can add a little bit on to that thanks uh everyone for sharing um Reuben. um you know, when, I, when when Cyrus came to me and, and asked me about safety in public space, I I was excited because I knew that Cyrus always finds um, the most hopeful, joyous, <laughs> Afro-futurist Afro way of, of, of pulling out content and creating. Um, but also it was an, it was a, it was an opportunity for me um, to, to imagine something different. To, to step into this um, science fiction, <laughs> so to speak, um, to think about the what would feel good, what would feel safe, as opposed to how do you protect yourself? How do you uh, how do you combat it? How do you how do we show up for each other? Um, questions like what Just, Justine just had around like how much is too much of this intake of constant trauma, right? And and how do we not get desensitized? just seeing it over and over and over again. Um, and when I say not desensitized, I mean that there's there's a way that it can break people down. It can make people feel defeated. It can make us feel like um, not enough is changing, um, but also it allows people to see what is actually happening in the world. I feel like COVID-19 and this virus and pandemic and these elections this year have all shown us um, that, um, Sorry, um, have all shown us that that what was already here, what was already existing, how people were already surviving um, in a world that's unfair and layered, right? And and I get asked so many questions now about what's what what do you think that how um, COVID has affected trans people in, in the health industry? And, um, go uh, and I and I was like, well. It hasn't changed. You're just aware that there's a discrepancy for what we have and what and what um, and what other folks have. And so in this time period of, of, of we had to reckon with all the parts of ourselves, the ways that we participate in other people's dehumanization, the ways in which we might not have been aware um, of what people were facing on a daily basis. Um, I think is, is a really powerful project, I think, uh, and I'm really excited to continue this conversation and hear all the questions and ideas um, that was on top of my brain around um, this whole period of time. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to pick up on a couple things that I that I heard and Raven, I, I really, I really like what you said about how, you know, these issues have always been there. Um, I think in the early days of this pandemic, we were talking about how COVID was this great equalizer and how we were all in this together. And then pretty quickly we learned, oh, we're not. Um, like something's, something's wrong. Not, not everyone has the same experience of this pandemic. And so um, I think that, that you, you've raised some re really important points about that as well. Um, and Cyrus, you, you were talking about how you were really thinking about your audience when you were creating this, this project. And I love what you said about how, you know, this is, this is for us, this is for the, the Black trans community. Um, I think there are so many projects now in the arts that I'm seeing more and more of, um, you know, as, as a BIPOC person where, 
you know, we're making this for us. Now we're not, we're not explaining, we're not putting in parentheses, oh, for everyone else, here's the inside joke. Um, here's the, here's the parentheses information that you need to know to give you the context that you need to understand our experience. We're not doing that anymore. We're saying these are our experiences and they can sit by themselves. Um, and if you don't, if you don't come to this experience or you can't come to this installation with that knowledge, then Google is a free tool. <laughs> um, so how I'm wondering, you know, in, in knowing all of this, where do you see sort of the next stage of this work or this type of work? Where does radical love go from here? I think first of all, yes, this idea that, um, you know, we we have an opportunity to uh, imagine um, a future world uh, through our actions, right? So if we're saying that we want to centralize BIPOC queer and trans leadership, why are, what, and then we need to just do that, right? So we need to make our work, we need to put our work out there. And if the other organizations and the other, you know, contexts don't have the right folks on staff or in leadership to be able to interpret our work or understand our work because they haven't done the work of, of building relationships with the East Asian and Southeast Asian community or the Black or Black and Afro-Indigenous communities or whatever, then that's on their, that's their loss, right? You know, so we're starting to prefigure these communities that we want to live in, in the future, we're starting to live in them now, right? So we're making work for ourselves. We're making work that is for us, by us. And I think that there is something really powerful about that. Um, I mean, to me, this project is also about trying to reimagine our cities, right? So as we try to prefigure these communities we're trying to live in, what would our cities need to look like in order for the people who we've depicted in, the, in these works to be considered inherently valuable? You know, what would it need, to, what would need to change in order for our lives to be considered expected, planned for, uh, celebrated, uh, honored, loved in these communities, you know, so that you wouldn't, Justine, ever have the kind of experience that you had, that none of us would, that Raven would feel as safe walking at 2 p.m. as she did at 2 a.m. You know, what would need to change in order for our lives to be considered inherently valuable? And so I know that a lot of what would need to change would be the way that we've structured our societies around these hierarchies. So we've created these cityscapes that are, um, you know, rooted in class, uh, class hierarchies, right? So we've grouped ourselves into these class pockets, you know, around racial lines, you know, uh, you know, we, we've shut out entire populations from being part of community dialogues, homeless and houseless folks, you know, street involved folks, you know, folks who are disenfranchised and removed from our conversations, you know, all of that would need to change, you know, thinking about, you know, even just the conceptualization of safety for who. So when we think about what a safe community in the future would look like, like, it necessarily wouldn't have the police if we were thinking about a safe community for racialized people, particularly Black and Indigenous, but for all racialized people, it wouldn't have the police. If you're thinking about how do we make a safe community for white people, probably it does involve the police because their job is to in, you know, erase racialized people and, and trans people and disabled people from the cityscape to make room for white people to live, right? So, so it just depends on safety for us. So if we're imagining a safety for us, it's gonna look beautiful and radically different different and then it will be rooted in radical love right so Che Guevara you know that idea that the notion that the revolution must be guided by love and how that's a shouldn't should be such a radical notion so if we root our communities in, in radical love if we root our communities in a world where we are considered inherently valuable well then what do they look like what do they what do they sound like what do they taste like what do they what do they smell like you know what how are they laid out you know who lives here you know, what do what the resource sharing look like, you know, and we can start to try, to try to plan for those things. So I think radical love is a proposition. It's a proposition to think about the, to think about getting involved in building these worlds that we say we want to live in, in 2025 and 2030. Okay, well, let's start building it. Let's start building it together. I love that. Go ahead. Um, I also feel like it's about the truth. You know, I think there's, there's so many of us who, um, when everyone was putting out the we're all in this together thing, 
knew it wasn't true. <laughs> like knew it wasn't true in our hearts of hearts, want it to be true, but actually have lived lives where we understand that that is an impossibility until we recognize um, that we're on stolen land, that we're having elections on stolen land, that we're still celebrating Thanksgiving and all these other um, traditions and holidays Memorial Days, all these days that, that celebrate the disenfranchisement of people around the world, right? And I feel like radical love also gives us an opportunity to, to, to sit with ourselves and, and, and um, our discomfort. Um, like this year, 2020, it's like 2020 vision, right? Like opening up yourself to um, see everything that's happening happening around you, see the world that you're actually living in, the people that you actually impact and affect, like the environment, the climate. Um, there's so many people who are using their art as activism um, in the ways that was happening during the Black Renaissance. It's happening now that art is used as this way, this weapon, almost uh, like a hammer to make people understand like what a possible future is, what is actually happening and to challenge people to, to step more um, in line with being in better relationships to each other. Um, that's also, I feel like it allows us to have this radical commitment to, to conflict and to, to, to working through it as opposed to just trying to find ways to skirt around it, um, actually having to, to deal with each other. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, uh, as you're talking about, you know, asking these big questions, you know, what do, what does our future look like? What do we want it to look like? How do we create the scenarios that allow for this, this collective future that we say that we want? Um, and Cyrus, you've, you've touched on a couple of those things and, you know, we're having these larger discussions in our, in our culture right now, generally about, you know, abolishing the police and thinking about a radical new structural way of thinking of how we organize our cities and what are the frameworks in which we we rely upon to support the people who live in these spaces. Um, I wonder, and this is a very big question, I wonder if anyone on the panel here has any thoughts on you know, what are what are the, the big pillars of what's next um, when thinking about our cities and thinking about restructuring our cities um, for safety and for, you know, true collaboration and true co-living um, with one another? Well, I can start um, being here in Toronto, Toronto, for those who know it by that name. Um, the one dish with the one spoon. There are ways that, that indigenous folks figured out how to get along with each other long before colonization, long before um, white supremacy had its way with the way in which we relate to each other, right? And so I think that um, I'm a firm believer in this principle of Sankofa. Like it, the picture of a Sankofa bird is one where the feet are forward, but the head is looking backwards. So you are aware of um, the past of everything that happened before um, and, and you're also moving forward. Um, understanding that you can only move forward once you understand and reckon with the past. I think there's so many ways that Canada specifically has, has been allowed to get away with its, per, uh, its participation in slavery, enslavement, um, its continued participation in those things, its participation in regime war changes, all the ways in which um, indigenous people have been dehumanized and disenfranchised by pipelines being run through grave sites. Like we are in a time period where all of that needs to come into question. Our comforts and what we, we like having light in our house, having, are we okay losing that so that indigenous people can live their lives freely on their land? Our, like, you know, those things I think um, is, is where I hope we're going in, in all the conversations and all the, the lead ups. I think there is, um, I think we need to start listening to the people who have been talking all this time. There's a huge um, sort of thing in activist communities. Uh, I find where people often say I'm speaking for as opposed to I'm speaking with. Um, I have been given the opportunity to speak up in relationship to these general people. 
Um, but when we only pick out one or two or three or four, we miss the millions of different voices and experiences. And um, then you don't even get to expand what truth is, what, what experience is, um, if you're only talking to a fraction of, of people who are actually around your social bubble. Um, so that's what I hope, that we break social bubbles and, and capitalism. Snaps for sure, snaps for sure. And I think this, uh, this idea um, that comes from disability justice we take care of we take care of each other. We take care of each other. That that gets threaded through abolitionist work. I mean, I've been an abolitionist for twenty five years, and have been involved in abolition work on Tur Turtle Island for twenty five years. And this idea that we take care of each other. We don't need the police to take care of us to keep us. They're not keeping our community safer or more secure. They're not reducing conflict, crisis, and harm. You know, they're not doing that. We do that. We take care of each other. And it comes from this notion of disability justice where you know BIPOC people came together and said actually we, we pod map we, we do mutual aid we practice how to take care of each other we, we root our work in that so I think that one of the pillars going forward for this future that we're looking at is one where we radically recenter our idea around taking care of each other you know what would it mean to take care of people that you don't know? What would it mean to, to reach out across difference as Audre Lorde encourages us to do and to, to, and to, and to be part of someone's pod and to, and to, and to support them through, through, through difficult times? What would it mean to get involved in resolving a conflict you know, that in, in a community that you're not part of you know, as a way of building networks of care? You know? So I think that one of the pillars that we're gonna see is this idea of radically relating to each other in in much better ways than we currently do uh, and i think that that's that relationality is what i i see threaded through in speculative fiction is you know how are how are the how, I'm, that's what i read octavia and pour over is how, but how are they how are they handling conflict you know how are they handling the, the the things that come up and i think that what we see is is this this radical care you know rooting everything in care I want to pick on Emmy a little bit because before we jumped on this call, um, you know, we started talking about your work, Emmy, and I think in many ways you're already doing this, this, this care, and and we are, you know, a, lo a lot of us are are starting, I think, to really think about this in a more meaningful way. But I wonder, Emmy, if you could share a little bit about how you know your work has been rooted in in caring for the communities that you're a part of and how that's taken different shapes and forms. Cause I got to hear a little bit about it, but um, I don't think everyone here did and certainly not everyone who's watching at home. Yeah, I, I learned it from my parents and my community, like the Cambodian community in Montreal where um, the ways the ways like we, we were onboarded through a settlement program in Ottawa and there was a high density of Cambodians in that particular community. So we started to share information, share knowledge around how do we, well, how, how do we survive? <laughs> how do we get work? How do we, how do we mobilize? And it was always around food. It was always around food. It was usually on the floor on this scale, so a plastic uh, knitted uh, mat and we spoke our language and we uh, we shared work together. So a lot of the the work within the Cambodian community in Montreal is centered around textiles. So like assemblage. So assembling textile. So you would drop off a bag of clothes, or you would sew with each other, cook with each other, eat together, and uh, and then uh, and then you would get information. And I think that's uh, so what. What I've started to do within my community at OCAD is to do these these events around food and around sharing uh, knowledge and experience around resilience and transformation and uh, different forms of liberation and criticality around what we're doing and uh, and I learned it from my parents so I'm trying and I'm I'm finding this. These, these other spaces where I'm gaining experience and, and uh, 
not experience, getting information and knowledge from them of how to how do we shape a space and a community of care. So yeah. I think Thank I you. could just add, I think one of the things that I've really seen this year more than any others um, in the general mainstream space is this recognition really of the solidarities we need to form across um, Asian communities, Black communities, Indigenous, like all, you know, the whole, everything, everyone. <laughs> um, I don't think I've seen that kind of dialogue more than I have this year, which, you know, even right now with this um, exhibit or this initiative at the Bentway, having receipts next to radical love is something that I think is really powerful to, to understand or to see how, you know, all of our oppressions or experiences may be unique to our culture or unique to our identities, but still linked to one another. Um, and I thought that that was a really powerful piece as well. And I think it's in terms of how do we build for the future that we want? I think that's one of the critical pieces, at least for me of what I've seen this year is for the Asian population, at least I'll only um, speak from my own experience and what I've seen in my own communities is this recognition suddenly of how we are a part of this white supremacist system as model minorities and how we are contributing to, to this system. And so I think having these two installations side by side is actually a really powerful piece to, to recognize that or to come and reckon with that. And I think we need to have more of those conversations. Like I'm a Filipina Canadian and I need to speak to my community about how we have contributed to anti-Blackness because we have. And I think recognizing that is one of, and speaking about it and trying to untangle all of this is one of the really critical parts in building the futures that we want. Snaps. Yeah, snaps for sure on that one. Um, I know that, you know, for a lot of us, we've been having hard conversations probably conversations that we should have had a long time ago um, in this time. And it is a privilege to be able to, <laughs> to have those hard conversations with the people who are closest to us. Um, Justine, I remember reading about your experience as well and, and how you talked about um, how there's never a right way to respond, but you know, how you received a lot of, a lot of affirmation or um, people were sort of being um, congratulatory or very kind with you about how you responded to that incident. Um, I wonder if you can give us a little bit more context about, about that and, and what you sort of think about it, looking back on it now. Yeah, so when I posted and I shared, I really took action because this person also expressed to me that she was a teacher, which I found to be extremely dangerous if um, you harbor these racist beliefs and you are in front of a classroom teaching in Toronto of all places. Um, and I received just so much feedback about how strong and powerful I am and how great of an example I've set, which yes, um, but I also, again, recognize my privilege in doing so. Um, and I also received a lot of emails and DMs from other Asian folks who expressed to me that their own experiences of racial harassment or racism in whatever shape or form and how they were unable to speak it out loud and a lot expressing remorse or regrets or guilt or maybe even like a little anger in themselves for not speaking up. And I don't know, that part made me a little bit sad in the sense that we take that responsibility on and yeah and I just received so many comments about how uh, how mine was the right way to respond you know you need to speak up against racism you need to hold power to or people to account and whatnot and I don't know there are so many positions of and very unique circumstances of individuals that does not allow for that, you know? Like I just happen to be in a position where one, I'm a, let's just say, you know, as an example, I'm a freelancer. I don't, I don't work in a specific place where I might be afraid to speak out because it might, I don't know, hurt that company or 
I don't know. There's so many different circumstances, you know, that ha that don't allow people to speak or make people afraid to speak up because of the repercussions of that. And I just hated, uh, I don't know, it's so complicated, right? Because while on one hand, of course, I'm proud of my actions of speaking up. But on the other hand, I hope that it doesn't sh spread the wrong message that everyone who hasn't spoken up is doing the wrong thing, you know, because it doesn't take into consideration so many of other people's lived experiences. And there, yeah, I just don't think there's one right way to respond to this kind of encounter. And to be honest, like when you're in that moment, like it is so hard to think of how to respond properly, properly. You know, I just happen to I just happen to be really plugged into social media. I just happen to know how to share this kind of information, but not, you know, not a lot of people do. And so, I don't know, it's a very complicated experience of being told that. Um, and I just want to be cautious of what we're telling other people who don't feel comfortable or safe, even safety, <laughs> back to safety of speaking up. Yeah, I feel like it, it lands for me on, on this idea of respectability, like respectfully, like if you are just respectful enough, if you were good enough, if you were nice enough, all the things that we as Black and POCs are told growing up to survive through this world, um, if you are just, 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 just. Um, but we know that that doesn't save lives. We know that that hasn't saved so, so many lives. Um, even in our own families, right? There are so many of us who are affected multiple different ways in all of our intersections. Um, and so if we take respectability out of the way we're asking people to respond to violence, as opposed to talking about that violence, um, it allows for the person who perpetuates that violence to um, walk away without actually taking any responsibility for it. So you, one, have to sit with the harm and then be responsible for how you responded to the harm. Um, and, there, and, the, and the question becomes then what happens to the person who, who dolled it out to you? Yeah. You know, and that's what abolition is. It's like, how does that person get the care and the exactly. community that they need in order for them to shift and change that harmful behavior? Um, as opposed to us just trying to find ways to navigate around it as, as femmes, as women of color, as queer folks, as trans folks. You're always having to, as a dancer, you're always trying to find ways to um, design yourself around or, or navigate yourself the way through um, violences. That's why I'm a burlesque performer too, like trying to find all these ways to use like glamour and, um, and, and fashion or whatever um, to get people to pay attention or to take you seriously or to, um, or to for me, what it really is about is, is recognizing our collective humanity and elevating that so that we stop this, um, this lateral harm, this intersectional harm, all of it. Um, so I got that too, because I, I did a speech this, this summer and it, it kind of went viral and everyone talked about the way that I said it. Oh, you said it so calmly. And I was like, no, it's my, my voice is soft. I wasn't calm at all, actually. <laughs> um, that's just how I speak. Um, so if I'm yelling it, if I'm screaming it, if I'm crying it, if I'm yeah. writing it down, if I'm creating art about it, it all is the same volume. It all it has to have the same yeah. weight. Um, so we also have to think about who who is being left out of the conversation when when um, verbal language isn't there, um, isn't the way that they is they share. That is in itself is able. Right, and so mm -hmm. if we're talking about a revolution where everyone has, um, you know, space and um, sovereignty, resurgence, liberation. Um, then we have to make it for everyone, so everyone is sitting around that that global village table. Snaps. Um. <laughs> I'm mindful. Uh, we have about five minutes left, and I want to make sure that we we have some time for questions before everyone has to has to head off to the next Zoom on a Monday. Um, so I'm just going to pop into my little Q and A box to see if we have any questions. And you at home, if you have any questions, please pop them in there now because we will be 
logging off, uh, logging off soon here. While right. you look at that, Kenya Jade, I'll just mention um, Raven to the point of what happens to the person who doled out whatever to you, this violence to you. That's something I've been thinking about a lot, you know, because this woman who did this to me, I'm, you know, there was a lot of fixation on this person, but for me, one, she's one person. And as we see in receipts, as we see in radical love, there's been so many experience of this that it's not, yeah, it's not unique. It's a, I want to know what are the systemic forces that have led this woman to even think this way, you know, because at the end of the day, she's probably right now just hates Asian people even more. You know, there's nothing in place that has allowed her to learn or to grow from this experience. And so that to me is scary, you know, and how do we, I guess that's the question of, you know, with, with safety or hyper visibility or the futures we want to build, how do we do that? And, you know, all of us, all of you are doing this work already. And so I, think I just hope we see more of it. Yeah, and in this proximity of having receipts and radical love side by side and having this conversation that we're having today and continuing to have these conversations about the ways that these things are playing out in our communities and the overlaps and the ways that we can show up for each other and uh, interrupt white supremacy as it's happening. Um, I think that that is a radical way forward, right? Is that, you know, we are starting to, you know, build coalitions build, uh, uh, dare I say it, armies, you know, of people who are ready to fight against white supremacy, who are ready to, 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 to do the work to imagine that where we're getting to after we win, which we will, you know, and and starting to, to to really plan and imagine, you know, what's possible. So I think that, yeah, our community is coming together. Excuse me, I'm our communities coming together more and more is is one of the ways forward. And I think that having creative expressions that uh, and, and then conversations that allow us to bridge the, the similarities and the differences in our communities are really essential. I mean, Audrey Lord, she cuts, she said it right. We have to find ways to relate across difference. And we've never been particularly good at that, but we're getting better. And we're going to win. We're going to do this. I think that's a really, a really beautiful note to sort of cap things off at here. Um, you know, this idea we've talked a lot about what it means for our communities to, to stand together, but then also physically to have um, radical love and receipts side by side at the bent way, um, I think is a quite a beautiful thing and something that folks can check out until November 11th. Um, so, uh, Again, I wanna thank all everyone here for, for joining us um, and thank you for your time and for sharing these stories which are so personal and deeply embedded to you. I know it's not always easy, um, but it's generous. It's, it's so generous and so, so, so appreciated. Um, so again, for folks at home, uh, please check out what the Bentway is up to. Um, and know that Radical Love and Receipts will be uh, at the Bentway in the Safety and Public Spaces Initiative um, until November 11th. Um, that's it from us here. Thank you so much. I think we can do a round of snaps to close this out, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and I believe that this will be shared on the Bentway's website as well. Um, so do, do check that out. All power to the people. Thanks, Kenny Jade, for moderating. Of course, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.